been studying the course of heaven, and uh, I am thrilled at the results that I'm seeing in your lives, uh, the testimonies I'm hearing, and uh, you're going to see why today. So let's open our Bibles to the book of Luke, the 18th chapter, and we're going to begin today on presenting our cases in the courts of heaven. In Luke, the 18th chapter, verses 1 through 8, and you may want to underline this, there's a number of significant thoughts in this passage of scripture that you'll want to refer to from time to time. And the Bible says this, it says, then Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. One version says men ought always to pray and not give up. He said, in a certain town there was a judge who, was, who neither feared God nor cared what people thought. And there was a widow in that town who kept coming to him with the plea, grant me justice against my adversary. For some time he refused, but finally he said to himself, even though I do not fear God, nor do I care what people think, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will see that she gets justice. So that she won't eventually come and attack me. The Lord said, listen to what the unjust judge says. And will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will see that they get justice and quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? Now, we want to learn how to present our petitions, how to present our cases before the Lord. See, I want you to step into this dimension and see God's passion towards you. I want you today to purpose in your heart to begin to move with boldness, to begin to move with confidence before the Lord, before the courts of heaven. First of all, let me say to most of us that if there's anything we need to do, we need to get off the battlefield. We need to get off the battlefield. The first thing we must do is to step into the courts of heaven, or the first thing we need to do in order to get into the courts of heaven is to get off the battlefield. You can't be on the battlefield and in the courts of heaven. We have to recognize the need for legal precedence to be set, for legal precedence to be one for us before we run out onto the battlefield. We are in a conflict, but before it's a battle, it's a legal conflict. Do you understand that? See, I, I think that the church has put such emphasis on battlefield, battlefield, battlefield. We're in a war, we're in a war, that we forgot that our greatest battle is in the heavenlies, not on a battlefield. I want you to know Jesus never pray, never pictures prayer in a battlefield context. <laughs> he did, however, put it in a courtroom and a judicial setting, as we saw here in Luke 18, verses 1 through 8. In this parable, the widow is seeking a verdict of justice from a judge, an unrighteous judge. Among other things, one glaring aspect of this story stands out to me. This woman, in her efforts to deal with with her adversary, never spoke to her adversary once, but only to the judge. You know, I'm, I'm concerned at how many Christians are running around talking to devils. She understood that when a rendering could be obtained from the judge, then her adversary became of no consequence. The adversaries legal footing for hurting, harming, stealing, or otherwise tormenting her would be removed. The adversary would have to bend his knee to the verdict of the court. Once the court rendered a verdict, then it could be executed into place. The verdict from the court is the legal wrestling that we do. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. We wrestle in a court of law, and the executing of it into place is the battlefield. 
See, we've tried to run out to the battlefield without verdicts from the court. So we found ourselves ineffective or even soundly defeated. Those days are over as we get off the battlefield and we get on into the courtroom. Amen? Amen? So this is what the Apostle Paul was referring to in Ephesians 6 and verse 12 when he said, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. Now, you're going to find out that those categories, there's seven of them throughout the scriptures, speak about different domains that God will lead you into. We found out that there are seven different courtrooms in heaven. Not all of us can go into every courtroom, at least not all the time. But God will lead you into different courtrooms. There's four of them that are open to everybody, concerning yourself, concerning your family, concerning areas where he's given you authority over. Then some of you are, be giving, are, are being given authority at different levels of authority, different responsibilities to go into on behalf of the nation. I don't think it's peculiar that there are so many people in this church that are somehow getting involved in some form of politics, some form of social justice, some form, but you have to understand that you will not win those battles just because you have a cute idea. Those battles must be won in the courts of heaven before you'll ever obtain them in the battlefield or in the marketplace. Some of you are going to be Daniels, Josephs, Esthers, Debras in the marketplace. But you have to go into your spiritual place of, in the courts to obtain the things that God wants you to have in this world. The big deal that's coming. I'll tell you what, I've watched so many people come to me and they think just because they can get in front of a minister, just because they can align the pocket of somebody that they're going to get the deal. Let me tell you something. These are not natural battles you're fighting. They're spiritual battles. These spiritual battles must be fought in a spiritual realm and you must get a verdict from heaven in order to enforce it on earth. If you obtain something and you do not have the legal right to it, you'll have it for a while, but it'll be taken from you because legally the enemy will come back and say, he can't have it. That's why so many prosper for a moment and then just at the right time, the enemy pulls it all away from you because you didn't obtain it legally. Now tap your neighbor and say, I think he's talking to you this morning. You know, this, this idea of wrestling you know, it's a very apt term for what goes on in the courts of the Lord. You see, through our maneuvering in the courts, we actually put into place the legalities that are necessary for God's kingdom and his will to be done. I don't know if you've ever been in a natural court setting, but even if you go there, you'll attest to it. You'll, you'll see that this is what happens in a natural court setting. I've had the privilege of being in our court system here in Zimbabwe, and it's very amusing sometimes and very frightening sometimes to watch what goes on in our courts. But the attorneys are there, and they're maneuvering, they're operating, they're wrestling with each other to get the upper hand. Well, the same is true in the courts of heaven, especially when we're dealing with principalities over regions. It is our job to enforce the legal judgment that Jesus won on the cross. And we enforce it upon the powers of darkness, stripping them of all the illegitimate authority that they hold over us, both individually and corporately. Now, it takes some legal wrangling to get this in place. Once it's done, once you have the legal mandate, the verdict, you can, watch on, you can march onto your battlefield and win every single time. See, the battle in the courtroom always precedes the victory on the battlefield. Let me say that again. The battle in the courtroom always precedes the victory in the battlefield. See, we are all learning to win in the courtroom so that we can win on the battlefield. Once we can change our perspective, once we can see this thing differently and see that the primary place of conflict is in the courtroom, then we'll be ready to present our case. 
So today I want to give you six points of how to present your case. First of all, presenting our case. Well, we can only present our case once we have read from the books of heaven. You know, I'm always shocked at how many people, you know, just suck stuff out of the air. Well, here's what I think. You, you're going you're, you're, you're gonna to approach demons and you're going to approach Almighty God with what you think? I don't think that's a good idea. He says, my word never returns void. It, it always accomplishes the purpose wherein I send it. He says, my thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are not your ways. I, I wouldn't go before God with my ideas. I'd go to God with his ideas. You'll probably get a better success rate if you honor him with his ideas. In Daniel chapter 7 and verse 10, 10 it kind of sets the scene. It says, a fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. A thousand thousands ministered to him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court was seated and the books were opened. Whew, I'll tell you what a picture. Thousands and thousands of angels. A cloud of witnesses. Thousands before him. The books are open. The court is seated. I'll tell you what, here's the good news. The books are open. The books aren't locked. They're not sealed. They're not closed. This means that you and I have a right to go look into those books. We can discern by revelation what are in those books. On a personal level, those books reveal our kingdom purpose. They reveal our destiny. And we have to understand, this is not a once-off revelation. You know, so many people say, yes, I know what I'm supposed to do. I wish I knew what I was supposed to do. I've been doing this for 45 years. I've been in this country for 38 years now. And somebody says, well, yes, you know your purpose. I know part of my purpose. But each time I go before God, it's like, oh, there's another look into what God has for me. Little by little, line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little, God begins to build you up from grace to grace, from faith to faith, from strength to strength, from revelation to revelation. He doesn't give it to you all at once. He gives it to you as you go and you open the books, you look in, and he'll give you another glimpse. He'll say, now take this ground. I promise you, if God had showed me what I would be doing today when I started, I would never have started. Think about it. You see, we have to understand that it's not a once-off revelation, but it's a journey of discovery. When you're dealing with cities or states or nations, let me tell you something. That's when we need legitimate prophecy, legitimate prophets, prophets to help us understand God's kingdom and his will as it's written in the books. You know, when a prophet prophesies, He's not telling you your phone number. He should be prophesying what are in the books of heaven about your future, about a nation. There's an unveiling of secrets that are contained in these books. A prophet is just reading out of the books of heaven and declaring what he sees. Once this is done, then you have apostles. Apostles that have a jurisdiction in a given sphere. Can begin to pre they can begin to present cases in the courtrooms of heaven on behalf of nations, on behalf of churches, on behalf of, of, of uh, businesses. That's why you have apostolic cover. That's why you want prophets and apostles. It's not some weird flaky thing you run around and, and, and it's not done on earth. It's not about oil on earth. It's about victories in heaven. we go before God and we begin to present a city, the state, or the nation in the court, we begin to remind God of what was written in the books, about what he said. We present our case and we put God into remembrance. Isaiah said it this way, God said, review the past for me, let us argue the matter together, state your case for your innocence. Man, I love that verse. State your case, argue your matter, come before me, wrestle with me, make your case so that I can bless you. God's not angry at you. 
He wants to give you what you can't, the case you present. You see, this operation sets the court in motion. Just visualize with me. Just let your mind run a little bit. Just as in a natural court, the, proceed, the proceedings start. Now, think about this. The judge on the throne, Almighty God, his son seated next to you. Your advocate. Sometimes he's standing next to you, Jesus, but sometimes it's the Holy Spirit who's your advocate. There's a courtroom full of witnesses. You're surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. Saints that have gone on before you. Angels are witnessing this. And as you stand before the throne, just as in a natural court, the proceeding starts with the prosecution presenting its case. You know, that's a powerful thought. That you and I as mortal people have the authority to set in motion the courts of heaven. You and I can set the court of heaven in motion. It's true. We begin to present from the books what has been written from before time began. The court comes to session. This is why in Daniel 7 the court is seated and the books are open. See, the, the court is going to make decisions based on what is presented from the heavenly books, the books of heaven, by you and by me. As individuals and corporately as the ecclesia. That's why all night prayer meetings or, or joining together for corporate times of prayer are so important. Oh, what an awesome privilege God's given us. Think about it. Number two. Once you're in the courtroom, we have to learn how to agree with our accuser. See, so you present your case. You're prosecuting a case. You're trying to bring to bear the witness of the Bible, the Word of God. That's a book. That book is also open in heaven. That's the book God gives us to study that unlocks all the other books through the revelation of His Word. He is the Word. And every word that He's written will never contradict His Word. But once we have presented the case of what has been written in the books, then we have to understand that we will also encounter the accuser seeking to deny us what is in those books. Revelation 12 and verse 10 says, Then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Messiah. For the accuser of our brothers and sisters who accuses them before our God day and night has been hurled down. You see, any and all accusations that he brings to seek to disqualify us from getting what is in the books has to be answered. This will require us not to argue with him, but to repent and humble ourselves before the Lord. We humble ourselves before the Lord for, our, for nations and for ourselves. It is in the interest of of the kingdom that we do so. You know, but in that parable in Luke 18 that we just read, it's, a, it's very interesting to me that the next part, after verse 8, verses 9 through 14, he gives a teaching about two men that went up to the temple to pray. And he contrasts how the Pharisee, who was self-righteous and arrogant, prayed, and while the tax collector was very humble and surrendered, the end of the parable was that the tax collector went down out, out of the house of God justified and the Pharisee was not justified. Look at what it says. It says, to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others, two men, he was speaking to these people, two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself. God, I thank you that I am not like other men, other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the tax collector, standing afar off, would not even so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you that this man 
went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. There's a heart attitude that we have to have when we go into the courts of heaven. Jesus spoke this parable in connection to, or at least as an extension to, his teaching of the judicial place, the woman who had importuned. See, to be justified means to render as just or innocent. To be justified is a legal position of being found not guilty or innocent. One of the things that Jesus is teaching in connection to the operating in the courts of heaven is that God responds to humility and surrender. That's why I like that song, Lord Overshadow Me So Much. I surrender, I surrender. There's something about surrendering. That says, God, I, I, you know what, I, I don't want to get in this place where I think I deserve something. I command heaven. I command, no, 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 no. You know, I've learned something. That there's times I even know that I'm right. But I would rather not make the demand, but rather say, Lord, I fall into the merciful hands of God. Give me not what I deserve, not what I'm right about, but what do you deserve? What do you think I deserve? I, I'll surrender myself to your best interest. What would you do for me, Lord? Because I tell you what, God always does more than I would ever do for myself. And he always has. Hallelujah. Humility, surrender, they carry a great weight in the courts of heaven. If we want to have an audience in the courts, we must appear there with a humble spirit and a broken and contrite heart. These are the sacrifices that God will not despise. Psalm 51, verse 17. My sacrifice, O God, is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart you will not despise. You see, through repentance, we set in place the voice of the blood of Jesus. And we release every other voice that has testimony. Now, I don't have time to teach it today, but there are nine voices that have testimony. The blood, the name, the, uh, the word of God. Uh, there, there are a multitude of voices that we can talk about. You can study it on your own. But these nine voices can speak into the court system as well. And we can agree with these voices in several ways. One of the primary ways that we can do is through our repentance. When we sense accusations being used against us, and I'll tell you what, the accuser of the brethren is constantly accusing you. We should simply agree with them. In Matthew 5, verse 25, it says that we should agree with our adversary quickly in the way. Agree with your adversary quickly while you're on the way with him, lest your adversary deliver you to the judge, and the judge had you over to the officer, and you'll be thrown into prison. Sometimes you get in the court of heaven, and I want you to know something, you get broadsided. You didn't know that the enemy had that against you. It's no use fighting him. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah, no, yeah, but doesn't work in heaven. Just, yes, Lord, he's right, I repent, I bring it under the blood of Jesus, I humble myself. That accusation, I nullify through the blood of Jesus, amen? You see, to agree with your adversary simply means that you're quick to repent of anything being used against us in the court of heaven. I have no need to answer for myself. I don't justify myself. For any reason, I allow the blood of Jesus to justify me. Amen. Then I can also draw from any other, uh, or all of the other voices in the court that would want to speak as well. I'm not even so sure that some of our cloud of witnesses can't speak. I, I, you know, it, it's amazing what goes on in that courtroom, and uh, we're only learning about it now. So let's ask God to keep showing us. But they will speak on my behalf only as I have repented and have taken access to the blood of Jesus. You see, self-justification can destroy us. But repentance will cause us to be accepted. We need to repent of anything in our history or even in our bloodline. Those kind of issues. And we may not even know what they are. But I've found that as I get before the Lord, sometimes he'll bring things to my remembrance. Sometimes he'll say, do you remember this? 
immediately. I don't let it become an accusation. I just confess it. I say, Father, I see that. That was a breach of your law. That was a breach of your word. That, that's contrary to what your scripture says. That was considered this or that was considered that according to the law. And as you grow in the law, as you grow in the teaching of the law, as you grow in the understanding of the word of God, guess what? It shows you your sin. Not to condemn you, but to, so you can confess it, so you can bring it to the courts of heaven and have it washed. You see, as we begin to repent of the things in our bloodline, even those things that we're not aware of, it's not uncommon for either the enemy or the Holy Spirit to begin to attack us in that bloodline. Huh. I know this. There have been times I've been moved to sorrow. I've been moved to nearly tears. Conviction in my heart. The sorrow for the sin that I had cre cre allowed or didn't even know was there because the repentance was so real. But when we do that, it takes away the accusation of the devil and it silences his ability to disqualify us. Number three, we need to learn how to confess our sins. See, our words before the throne of God are very, very powerful. In Hosea 14, verses 1 through 10, the prophet's urging us and urging the people to use words to return to the Lord. O Israel, return to the Lord your God, for you have stumbled because of your iniquity. Take words with you and return to the Lord. Say to him, take away all iniquity. Receive us graciously, for we will offer, us, offer us the sacrifice of our lips. That's a powerful passage of Scripture, Hosea. You see, here's the point. Write words. Write words before the court of heaven are very powerful. Very powerful. You see, it's because of our words that God will forgive us. The sacrifice of our lips in departing from iniquity and returning to the Lord give the legal right for God to forgive us. That's why John told us to confess our sins in John 1 and verse 9. He's really talking about the legal right for the forgiveness of sins. He says, if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. True. Doesn't that make a lot more sense in a legal setting? Our words set legal things in motion. Our words become testimony and agreements with the courts of heaven. Our words grant the Lord legal right to fulfill his passion towards us. And his passion is always mercy and goodness. This is part of what overcomes the accuser of the brethren, the word of our testimony. Again, in Revelations chapter 10, verses, or, or 12, verses 10 and 11, it declares that the word of our testimony in agreement with God's purpose overcomes and silences accusation. That verse says, Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren who accused them before our God, night and day has been cast down. And... I like this part. They overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony and did not love their lives even unto death. Do you see how powerful this is? Just tap your neighbor. Say, this is powerful for you. Tell your other neighbor. Tell him this. Say, part of the word of our testimony is to confess and use words that grant God the legal right to be merciful to us. Amen. The fourth thing that I want you to see today is that for us to come into concert and an agreement with the voices of heaven and things that silence the accuser, one of those things is our offerings. See, your finances have a voice. 
Finances are seeds. Seeds speak. Words are seeds. Words speak. Finances speak. Blood speaks. These things speak. They have a continual voice. So when we bring our finances into the house of God, when we bring it to the altar of God, when we, when we support the work of God, the kingdom of God, with a clean heart and full of passion towards the Lord, these finances add a voice of agreement with heaven. You know, it's appropriate to offer finances and then prophesy over them in the courts of heaven. When we do, we're becoming a part of the operation of heaven in order to see his will done on earth. You see, when you gain a mandate in heaven over your finances and you begin to declare it in the earth, you're unlocking the power of those finances on earth. Cornelius was not even a believer. He was a Gentile. But he believed in the God of Israel. He believed in God. And, and, and so the Bible says that his prayers mixed with his alms got the attention of God. To where God sent an angel to him and told him what to do. And the angel went and found Peter and told Peter what to do. And he brought them together so that the church, the Gentile age, could start. That's us. I thank God for Cornelius every day of my life. Because I'm not sure we would be here if it was left up to some of those disciples. Number five, we have to resist the devil. Re resist the devil. In order to get our prayers answered in heaven, there comes a time to resist the devil. When? Well, once the accuser has been silenced and the wrestling match in the courts is finished, we are now set to rebuke any and all demonic forces. This may, be, this may include the rebuking and renouncing of any or every demonic activity. But it's amazing how quickly the operation of the devil is stopped and removed once his legal rights are thwarted. See, once you've silenced him in the courts, it's easy to block him on earth. But many of us have been praying out of fear. I bind you, I bind you, I bind you. Go away, go away, go away. <laughs> devil, devil! Stop it, stop it, I tell you, stop it. In Jesus' name, stop it. If I pray all night, that, God, that means you have to stop it. No, no. Why do you think that by your much praying you are heard? It's not your much praying. It's, hey, you don't need to say very much to the devil if you have a legal writ. If, he, if God's given you the legal writ, if he's given you the legal jurisdiction, the legal judgment, you don't have to do very much praying. I mean, I think you should still pray, and I think sometimes the praying is while you're getting the legal jurisdiction. But once you have that, then it's, uh, excuse me, I'm serving, I'm ser you're served, you're served. Are you, are you listening to me? Hmm. Tap your neighbor and say, I might not have been praying 100% right. <laughs> When we have put in place, through our repentance, the legalities of heaven, then and only then will the devil have to stop and desist from all of his operations. You see, the legal right has been removed, and the rights of his operation are broken. If we have rebuked the devil and it hasn't moved, it's because he still has a legal right to be there. Colossians 3, 14, 13 and 14 shows us that Jesus that his, uh, set in place every legal, thing, every legal thing necessary to break satanic strongholds. L look at this. He says, and you, everybody say you. Tap your neighbor, say, say you. And you being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has 
made alive together with him, that's Jesus, having forgiven you all trespasses, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which are contrary to us, or which were contrary to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. So what, what is this really saying? He's saying, well, every bit of paperwork against us in heaven Jesus nailed it to the cross and took it out of the way. The, the, the words handwriting of requirements, or in some versions, ordinances, actually means a legal document and or a law, ordinance, or decree. In other words, here's what he's saying. Positionally, Jesus dealt with every accusation, every bit of paperwork that the, that the accuser can use to resist us in the courts of heaven. It's dealt with. In the heavenlies, by Jesus. He did it on the cross. It has been removed. But that doesn't mean the devil won't try to use it. Whether it is our sin or the sin of our bloodline, just as you and I had to appropriate what Jesus did for us when we were born again, it wasn't automatic. Just because he died on the cross didn't mean that you were born again. He paid for it in heaven, but there came a time when you had to appropriate it by confessing with your mouth, believing in your heart, asking Jesus to come into your life. So it is in the courtrooms of heaven. There are times where in specifics we must appropriate or execute it into place. The devil will seek to use these things against us. But we must take the blood of Jesus and with our repentance and our faith put what Jesus did for us in that given area. We verbally and with faith and forcibly put into place the work of Jesus on the cross on our behalf. And then when we do this, we have taken away any legal foot footing that the devil has against us or that he can try to use. In fact, in that verse of scripture, the word contrary in these verses means covertly. Put, put it back up there again. Look what it says. It says, having forgiven you all your trespassing, ha having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us. You could actually put in there covertly done against us. They're contrary, but they're done covertly. They're, they're, sometimes you don't even know. It's a covert action. The sacrifice of Jesus even deals with the hidden things in our bloodline that are standing against us. When by the spirit of revelation these bloodline issues come to light, that's why we have you in walking free. That's why we have born to grow. That's why we have... Uh, the the uh, breaking the bonds of iniquity, but when these things, when these issues in your bloodline come to light, you repent of these things. You apply the blood of Jesus. You break the, any place that the devil might have against you or be trying to exploit. And when we do this, we begin to be positionally, or at least positioned functionally, to get verdicts from the courts of heaven. You see, once we've silenced the accuser of the brethren. God is free to answer prayers on our behalf. And he does it from a father's heart. He's for you. He's, he's judge, but he's dad. If you, he's, he talks about the importuning widow. You go before an unjust judge. How much for, more will your father in heaven judge in your behalf? We have a just judge. He's your dad. So when you go, you go boldly, you go confidently. Even when the accuser says, you've done this, you've done this, you've done this, you've done this. With a broken heart, you say, yes, I have. I'm guilty as charged. But the blood of Jesus, my advocate. Do you understand? Any legal place that Satan has been using against us is removed. It's taken away. You see, once the legal right is broken, the devil will go where he's resisted. 
In James 4, it's very clear. Therefore, submit to God. Resist the devil, and he'll flee from you. Where, where do we submit to God? In the courtroom of heaven. Once you have a mandate from Jesus, resist the devil, and he'll flee from you. Are, are you following this? You see, submitting to God involves humility, surrender, repentance, and submission to the Lord. Once all this is in place, and any and every place of rebellion is out of us, all we have to do is resist, and he will flee. The devil no longer has any legal right to stay in our lives. Our rebuke now carries power, and he must flee. Finally, my last point today is we, learned, we need to learn how to make decrees. The last thing we do as legal representatives or as legal things have been ordered is we are free to make decrees. Once we receive the order from the courts, we're able to make decrees that carry authority not only in the courts of heaven but on earth. Our decrees are based on what is written in the books. Every objection has been removed and the judge is now free to fulfill his fatherly, fatherly possess, position and release his kingdom will in our lives. Didn't Jesus say it's my father's good will to give you the kingdom? He wants to give it to you, but he has to do it legally. He can't just do it. It must be done on a legal basis. Does that make sense? See, now there's nothing resisting us legally and the decrees now have power. Our decrees have power. To get the full effect of this understanding, I think we need to look at our position in the Bible. The Bible says that we are priests and kings. In Revelations chapter 1 verse 6 and Revelations 5 verse 10, it tells us that he has made us to be priests. He's made us to be kings. Priests and kings. Every one of you is a priest and a king. And, and so what does this speak of? Well, this speaks of our spiritual positioning in heaven. These are places given to us by and through the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. The job of a priest is to make intercession, to intercede. The job of a king is to decree things and they come to pass. When a priest intercede, or when priests intercede, they grant God the legal right to show mercy. Now, this is most clear in the Old Testament where the priests, the high priest and the priests would go once a year into the throne room of mercy. They would place blood of a sacrifice of a bull or a, of, 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 a, of, a, of a lamb on the mercy seat. And God would then cover the sins of his people and not bring judgment against them because the for a year, for, for an annual period. Every year they had to do this, but God would cover their sins annually. All the sins that they committed that year, they would be covered so his judgment wouldn't come. It was the day of Passover, the Passover lamb. It was prescribed by the Lord. And it would give God the legal right to roll the sins of the people back for one more year. The sins of the nation and the sins of individuals back for another year. But see, God, by his own mandate needed the function of the priest to administer the blood so that he could grant the legalities that he needed to bless and show mercy. Does that make sense? So the job of a priest is to strategically intercede so that the legal things are in place. Once legal positioning is obtained, then you move into your kingly role, and from that place in the spirit, you can begin to make decrees. This is why we are to be priests and kings to our God. Now, I think the best place you can see this is in the story that we see in John. <laughs> Chapter 11, verses 41 through 44, where Jesus comes to the tomb of Lazarus. Look at what he says. Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead man was laying. And Jesus lifted up his eyes. And listen to what he said. Father, I thank you that you have heard me. And I know that you always hear me. But because of the people who are standing by, I said this, that they may believe that you sent me. 
Now when he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he who had died came out bound, hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was wrapped with a cloth. And Jesus said to them, loose him and let him go. You see, Jesus comes to the tomb of Lazarus, and he says to the father, hey, listen, I know I've already prayed. See, Jesus has already been functioning in his priesthood. In fact, he waited four days. He stayed in his priesthood role for four days before he even journeyed to Lazarus' tomb. He has already dealt with every legal reason why Lazarus died prematurely. He has been in the courts of heaven, and he's dealt with the accusations of the devil that allowed Lazarus to die in an untimely, untimely fashion. He knows that everything is in place legally for what he's about to do. As a result, when he comes to Lazarus' tomb, he steps out of his priestly role into his kingship. And now he is no longer interceding. Now he is decreeing. And with authority, he simply decrees, Lazarus, come forth. You know, I've heard preachers say, if he would have just said, come forth, everybody would have come forth. That's not true. That's not true because... He didn't intercede for everybody. He didn't obtain permit for everybody. He obtained permit in heaven as a priest for Lazarus. This isn't helter-skelter. The prophets would tell you it's for everybody. Let me tell you something. Some of you will get your healings. Some of you will get your miracles when you go into the courtroom of heaven, when you plead your case, when you've humbled yourself, when you've repented, and a man of God will stand up and say, be healed in the name of Jesus. Come forth in the name of Jesus. Rise up, but you'll attract it. into the, A prophet will speak. Something will unlock, but it won't be for money, and it won't be a gimmick. It'll be the power of God unlocking something for the, from the heavenlies. For you. But some of you have gone beyond you, and you're beginning to pray for your nation. You're beginning to pray for others. Quite frankly, I'd rather see something happen for our nation than happen for me. I'd rather have something happen for the poor people I see on the streets, more and more of them lining up, begging, because there's nothing that we're doing for them. God, have mercy on them. Can't we unlock something in the heavenlies to where wickedness is really exposed? Can't we unlock something in the heavenlies where righteous men under the blood rise up and take their places? Righteous women rise up and take their places. Isn't it time? Isn't there a cause? Is there not a cause? Or are we just going to keep praying for ourselves instead of pray for our nation? Pray for those that we employ. Praise for our standing in the world. Praise for, pray for these elections that God would remove the filth and the wickedness and the corruption and that righteous men would find places that they would stand. That somehow a voice of righteousness would be heard in the land. That somebody could stand in front of the grave of the nation of Zimbabwe and cry forth, Zimbabwe, come forth! This is not the Zimbabwe we were promised, nor is it the Zimbabwe that we've envisioned. I'm tired of hearing we're so rich that we can't be poor. Really? Things shift. Things change. In these times, by executed verdicts from heaven that we put into place. As we utter words of governmental decrees, the heavenly realm is recorded and reordered and things come into place for heaven to invade earth. Now there's a contract in heaven. There's a verdict in place that allows heaven to manifest on earth. What a powerful thing. What a powerful thing. The Holy Spirit will help us in our weakness to maneuver the courts of heaven. But as we do, 
we become a part of God's agenda for this planet. Let's move forward and have his kingdom come and his will be done. Let's move forward and begin to seek what, it, what we can do in the heavenlies and bring them to pass for our lives, for our families, for our church, for our businesses.